According to FAA regulations, it's illegal to break the sound barrier over land. So what is it that the FAA doesn't like about supersonic flight over land? To answer that question, we're going to talk about some of the basic principles and challenges of supersonic flight. We're also going to talk about how several programs are aiming to solve the challenges involved with supersonic flight, especially in the commercial arena. Achieving supersonic flight is no easy task, but despite that, it has been done in the past with commercial aircraft such as the Concorde. But currently, there is no way for a civilian to fly at supersonic speeds. But there is a program that is aiming to solve some of the challenges involved with supersonic flight, especially over land. This program is known as the Quiet Supersonic Test Demonstrator, or QUEST. This demonstrator aircraft is meant to demonstrate the ability of an aircraft to have a muted supersonic boom. But to understand how they're achieving this goal, we first have to understand what a sonic boom is. The best way I've found to understand what a sonic boom is, is with an analogy that aerospace engineers use. As an airplane travels through the air, the air that encounters the surface of the wing is able to tell the air in front of it that the airplane is coming. That way, when this air encounters the wing, it's able to move out of the way so that the airflow is a little bit smoother. But there's a speed at which this information is transmitted, and that speed is the speed of sound. We measure the speed of sound as a Mach number. So the speed of sound is exactly Mach 1. So when the airplane is moving at Mach 1, the air doesn't have time to go ahead and tell the air in front of it that it's coming and that it should get out of the way. Because it doesn't have time to go ahead and tell the air in front of the airplane that the airplane is coming, the air gets slammed into the front of the airplane and it creates a shock wave. This shock wave is known as a sonic boom. This shock wave is so intense that it can be heard all the way from the ground as a loud, audible boom. And it's for this reason that the FAA has banned supersonic travel over land. This violent shock wave causes the air properties to change almost instantaneously changing the pressure, temperature, and velocity of the airflow. And for this reason, the aerodynamics at supersonic speeds change almost instantaneously. The Quest program is specifically aiming to solve the problem of the sonic boom. The way that this aircraft design is attempting to address this problem is by reducing the strength of the shock wave. There are several different types of shock waves. The first is known as a normal shock wave. This occurs perpendicular to the surface of the aircraft and is normally found in things such as inlets. A normal shock wave is the strongest type of shock wave, causing the pressure, temperature, and velocity to change the most dramatically of all the shock waves. A shock wave that occurs at an angle to the surface other than a perpendicular angle is known as an oblique shock wave and is much weaker than a normal shock wave. And in fact, the smaller the angle of the shock wave, the weaker the shock. The third type of shock wave is known as expansion waves, and this occurs when the airflow is becoming less restricted and the airflow is being able to open up more. So all of these shock waves combine to form a force known as wave drag. Wave drag is the specific type of drag on an aircraft caused by transonic and supersonic flight. Essentially what all supersonic aircraft aim to do is to reduce the impacts of wave drag. The first way that these supersonic aircraft are designed to mitigate the effects of wave drag is their very pointed nose. And if you look at almost any supersonic aircraft, you'll notice that there is a very small nose. This is specifically to make the angle of the oblique shock wave as small as possible. As I mentioned earlier, this is how you make the oblique shock wave as weak as possible. One of the best examples of this design being utilized on an aircraft is the fastest manned jet ever, the SR-71. If you look at all of the leading edges on this airplane, they're all ridiculously thin all the way down the edge of the airplane. Like I said, this is to make sure that they're oblique shock waves and they're much weaker than they would be if they were harder edges. Of course, the downside of this is the fact that these thinner edges are much more difficult to manufacture. 
With our modern day advancements in manufacturing processes and material sciences, we're now able to make the leading edge of aircrafts even smaller than we ever imagined possible. Looking at the quiet supersonic test demonstrator, we can see this principle in action. This Pinocchio nose of an aircraft nose is specifically designed to make sure that that oblique shock wave on the leading edge of the nose is as weak as possible. The second design strategy in mitigating the effects of wave drag is something known as the area rule. I first mentioned the area rule on this channel when I was reacting to Boom Supersonic's XB1 rollout. With the advent of jet engines in the 40s and 50s, it was starting to become abundantly clear that traditional aircraft geometries were not gonna cut it. They were creating immense amounts of wave drag. And it was around this time that aerodynamicists discovered that two aircraft with the same longitudinal cross section would create the same amount of wave drag no matter how that cross-sectional area is distributed in the lateral direction. Okay, so I probably lost a few of you there, so let me break it down in more layman's terms. Essentially, what this rule says is that it doesn't matter what shape the airplanes are, if they have the same area, they have the same amount of wave drag. It doesn't matter if it's a triangle-shaped fuselage or if it's a square-shaped fuselage, it doesn't matter. As long as they have the same area, they're gonna create the same amount of wave drag. Okay, but what does this mean for aircraft design? Essentially, the lesson learned from this principle is that if you decrease the area of the fuselage as you increase the area of the wingspan, you can decrease the amount of wave drag. So in other words, smaller fuselage, bigger wings, still the same amount of wave drag. And it's for this reason that we can see in designs such as the Quest program, the Ariane 2, and even boom supersonics plane that as the fuselage gets bigger before the wings and then as the wings start to increase in size the fuselage decreases in size this is to keep the same cross-sectional area pretty much consistent as you move down the aircraft so you get this kind of coke bottle design or as it's sometimes referred to wasting so basically if you want to follow the area rule in your aircraft design you want to decrease the size of the fuselage as you increase the size of the wings, which is another reason that we see aircraft such as the AS-2 Arion and Boom Supersonics XB-1 have a very long nose and a very gradual increase in cross-sectional area. Another great example of the application of the area rule in aircraft design is Arion's AS-2. Just like the Quest aircraft, this has a very long slender nose and it gradually increases in size to keep the cross-sectional area consistent, it also features wasting or that cook bottle shape as the fuselage narrows, the wingspan increases. All of these design choices dramatically decrease the wave drag on the aircraft and thus will decrease the supersonic boom that we'll hear. As cool as it is to hear those supersonic booms from time to time, I'm sure you don't wanna hear those on a day-to-day -day basis. And that's why the area rule is such a pivotal principle when designing future supersonic commercial aircraft. And the quiet supersonic test demonstrator is gonna be instrumental in taking that first step towards a return to supersonic commercial flight. If the quiet supersonic test demonstrator proves to be successful, I anticipate that the FAA will administer a certification to certain aircraft that will allow them to fly at supersonic speeds over the land. I expect that the FAA will grant it in the same way that they do ETOPS certifications. ETOPS stands for Extended Range Twin Engine Operational Performance Standard. This certification is required for twin engine aircraft to fly over the ocean because the FAA regulation dictates that an aircraft has to have more than two engines to fly anywhere farther than 60 minutes away from an emergency landing. But as jet engines have become increasingly more reliable, certain aircraft such as the 787 have been able to achieve ETOP certifications which allow them to do transatlantic flights. Provided that the Quiet Supersonic Test Demonstrator is a successful program, I anticipate that the FAA will administer a similar certification for supersonic flight over land to aircraft that can meet its requirements. So do you think that supersonic commercial flight is in our near future? And if so, when do you think it's gonna happen? Let me know down in the comments below when you think it's gonna happen. And if you found this video informative, please consider giving a like 
It really helps the channel and it helps YouTube know that you like videos like this. And if you want to learn more about aerospace engineering in the future, make sure you subscribe to the channel. It really helps YouTube know that other viewers like you are enjoying this content. Thank you so much for watching and Godspeed.